Hello, and welcome to Ask Mama Amy, a podcast promoting practical advice and resources for strong mothers. I'm your host, Amy Shao, single mom and estate planning attorney and founder of Shao Law. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to have my friend Diana Lowe with us today. Diana is a certified executive coach and an emotional intelligence expert. And today I'm so excited to hear all about um, what she does and her own personal journey. Hi, welcome, Diana. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about what you do and just share a little bit about your business and, and why you ended up doing what you're doing. Sure. So I help remote leaders develop, deepen, uplift, however you want to say it, their emotional intelligence. And the emotional intelligence is really the number one skill that we're going to need in the future as we go more into AI, as we go into more of a remote environment. And emotional intelligence really means understanding our own emotions and how to connect with others, understanding others' emotions and being aware of how those that emotion can help you make a better decision. So it's a real paradigm shift from the old way of thinking, which was emotions don't belong at work and keep everything at home. And when you're at work, you don't have emotions because, you know, it's like saying, leave your arms at home. You can't do that. (laughs) So you have to bring your whole self to work. So I help leaders with that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And so for some background, um, Diana and I actually met when our kids are just newborns, babies, yeah, <laughs> right? I and I remember when I first met Diana, she just came across as this really just such good personal uh, skills and people skills oh. and her just like the way she handles her emotions and the way she teaches her kids about emotions was just what impressed me a lot. And when I learned uh, learned about what she does for a living, I was just like, this is what you're meant to do <laughs> for your life. Um, <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about that. How did you feel like that? Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know as a mom. And I'm so curious, Diana, if you could share with us um, your own personal journey. How did you um, decide to do what you do? Like, because what you do is so valuable to a lot of people, especially in the current, you know, as we're going, wrapping up or finishing up, or hopefully concluding um, COVID, a lot of people are working from home. And this piece um, is so important as people work together. So how, what's your own personal journey, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, so I took the the hardest, most glass uh, ridden road of rockiness to get here. It wasn't it wasn't a case of like as a child, I always knew I wanted to do this, so this is what I want to do. It took me many years to figure out, you know, like where do I fit in this world and what do I want to do in this world and how can I do this in a way that makes sense in this world. And as a child, I always knew that I wanted to help people, but that's so general, right? A doctor helps people. Uh, Somebody who works in a grocery store helps people. You know, they're all valuable jobs. So I had to learn. It took a long time to figure out what is that helping people look like for me? So I did know that early in my career, I started in finance, actually, and I worked in the city of London, and I also worked in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in pensions and finance and doing wealth management and working in different um, departments. And I did know from that point that the way people functioned at work, I wanted to be a part of that change. I was so beaten and battered and bruised um, from just mismanagement, poor management, and, and really so much so. It's kind of I'll be completely candid. It was, it got so bad that I was diagnosed with clinical depression and I had to take six months off of work. So it it was severe. And, and I don't think now that I know what I know, I don't think that's rare. I think that's actually really common how people are treated at work. And so what the best thing I know to do is take that difficulty and make it into something of value, create value in that. So Mm -hmm. as I went on this uh, journey, so I started in finance and as I started developing myself, I realized I love public speaking. I love communicating and I love people. Finance was not suited for me at that point in my career. So I, I had, Amy, it's like I had a dream that was implanted in me by somebody else. Mm-hmm. you know, and that kind of sprouted. Mm-hmm. And that's fine because I needed that to really understand my next step. So 
as I had many of these terrible bosses <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not naming or shaming in any way, but you know, they probably thought I was a terrible employee at the same point, you know, and maybe I was, maybe I wasn't certainly I was disengaged for sure. Mm -hmm. So as I realized, this is where I want to help people. That's how I got to what I do today mm -hmm. and just helping people be better with other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. Love it. And and coming from the so-called traditional industries like finance, those are really hard, like cold almost industries, right? Like you're expected to achieve a certain number or like have certain performance. And when you don't meet that, it's like you're an inferior person <laughs> or something and then not like blocking the emotion. So you being able to see that and using the obstacles to transform it to having a successful business now. And I know that you're coaching with directors and, and senior senior executives and fortune 500 companies. So do you mind sharing with us what are the maybe the common mistakes, if you will, that <laughs> these managers make and how you've been able to help them make a mind shift so that they could really elevate their team spirit and, and, and um, uh, create better productivity? And that's like such a wonderful, wide and broad question. So if I could give you a few examples, I think for me and really doing any work in emotional intelligence, it starts with yourself. Like you have to have your own emotional awareness. And the thing is, at least I can speak, I've worked globally around the world, but I can speak in the Western world for sure. We haven't really been taught about our emotions. They've been there, but it's like when you see somebody crying, oh, don't cry or don't worry about that feeling or this and that. But emotions are actually really valuable to give us information about things. And what I'm noticing in my work is that people have these feelings, but they don't, they don't know what they mean or what to do with them. So what they do is they like push them down. <laughs> and so they're like pushing them down, pushing them down. Them. And they're like, I feel run down or I feel tired or overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's because they're not fully processing them. And to be fair, we're all going through something traumatic, like with this um, COVID and quarantine. So there's a lot of emotions to be processed. But really, when I work with executives, we start with themselves, because if you can't manage yourself, you as the leader give people permission to do based on what you do. Mm -hmm. So if you can't manage yourself or have strong emotional regulation, mm -hmm. you create mistrust, you create the feeling that you are coming across as temperamental, you know, you create these things and it's not that people are meaning to do that. It's just, they don't know necessarily that they're doing it. And so like when I'm working with somebody, we really look at their, there are 42 different behaviors that we look at and we look at these behaviors and we see how do, how are, how are you showing up? How important is it to the other people? And how are you showing up? And if you're fine with the results and you're slightly misaligned, then that's good to know. But if you want to be better, what behaviors do you need to be doing? So we've come a long way in terms of emotional intelligence, because before we used to call it people skills, right? Like how good are you with people? But now with the science of emotional intelligence and the amazing tools out there, we can actually measure it that we know for every dollar invested, you get six back. Mm, I That's, love that statistics. <laughs> yeah. So, and there are numerous studies where companies and managers, executives have invested in their own emotional intelligence. You get a better work life, you get a better marriage, you get better friendships. So it all around helps the person. And I, I just love doing that. I love being a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I bet these um, high, like senior executives, they came to you for a reason. There must be, they must be feeling like stuck. Or <laughs> and do you know what? It's funny, Amy, that you say that because most people can identify in other people when they have low emotional intelligence. They go, oh, you know, my, my team doesn't work well, or, you know, I'm seeing this in the other person. So it's easy to recognize in other people and hard to recognize in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So they, mo they always come to me at first, like, oh yeah, this is what's happening with my team. Uh -huh. And then you have to think like, if you're working backwards, well, how are you showing up to be a uh -huh. part of that? whole equation, you know, takes uh -huh. two to tango, right? Yes. Yeah. And for you to be able to coach these um, senior executives, uh, take some uh, maneuvering, right? like setting the ego aside and for them to open up too, like uh, to be willing to look at themselves and, right. And it's true. 
And I think like when I think about the future of our work and our work situation, you know, we have little kids and by the time they're in high school, they may have streams of income Mm. from current technology. So they're not going to show up to work and put up with a boss that's terrible. Mm -hmm. And our kids certainly at at our, their young ages, they're talking about their feelings. So Mm -hmm. fast forward 15, 20 years, they're going to be in work and being like, I don't feel good about this, you know, whereas now that's kind of taboo to say, like, Mm -hmm. if you don't feel good about it, push it to the side, keep moving. Mm -hmm. But, Mm -hmm. you know, as we've seen globally, when people ignore feelings or that sort of emotion, that creates really bad decisions. So they're an important part of our decision-making process, emotions. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so, when you're working with these um, senior executives, what is the one transform? I mean, there are so many different transformative uh, <laughs> factors in this. But what would you say is one thing that helped them uh, to create or elevate their team spirit? What was the the breaking point? So that's a good question, and I think a l- like my clients can sometimes say it feels like a Jedi mind trick. <laughs> like when they understand how to work with people better, they're mm-hmm. like, you will do this. And the person goes, oh, I will do this. But it, <laughs> it's not quite like that. But it's when you really understand uh, how people communicate their energies, what they need to hear from you. And when you're more woke, if you will, to other mm-hmm. people's needs and what they need to see from you, life is just easier. Mm -hmm. And that creates more trust. And when you have more trust, you have people who are willing to work harder. And when you have people who are willing to work harder, there's higher productivity, more profitability. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it all comes back to that. uh 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 I love that. I love that. And And if people aren't loyal these days, (laughs) loyalty is not one of those. I was going to say, if people aren't loyal these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. it, It may not be a value, but at least you're not, you can expect people to leave quickly mm-hmm. mm-hmm. to stay a little bit longer through. Why wouldn't you do that? You know? Mm-hmm. Now, do you work with the team as well or, um, or just the coach or just the, the executive? <clears throat> so I work with both. Mm-hmm. So typically I'll start with, it's like, it goes one or two ways. It's either, an executive says, hey, I want you to work with my team because they're doing this. That is one way to work. But typically what I have found is that the executive, they come and they say like, you know, I'm having this problem. And then we really look at them. Like, let's talk about your leadership first. And then as they see the value of it and how much easier it is for them to communicate, they're less stressed, they're more productive, then they go, okay, I think my team needs us too. Mm-hmm. So I would say like 80% is executive and then this 20% is a team. Oh, I love it. Love it. And is they, they, it's like a package, right? Like they just bought the package or hours or how do you work? <clears throat> so I do a program. So I always upfront, you never know if they need a band aid or if they need surgery. So, mm-hmm. I, so I always <laughs> upfront do an assessment uh-huh. to understand what do you actually need? Because a lot yeah. of people, they say, oh, I need time management. Like that's always a symptom. Mm -hmm. But what's a little bit deeper? So we look at the needs assessment and say like, okay, this is what you need. We need to actually focus on you, not your team or Mm -hmm. vice versa. And then from the needs assessment, we look at their emotional intelligence behaviors. Mm -hmm. Like how is this affecting your work, your leadership, your productivity? And then from there, we we go into a program. So Mm -hmm. what does your specific, they're, they're customized. So what does your specific program look like? Does it look like just coaching? over Mm -hmm. six months or a year, or does it look more like um, team and group coaching? Or does it look more like just a program? I have different programs that I run that might just be monthly needs. Mm. So it just depends on how, uh, what a company needs. Right, right. That makes sense. Now, Diana, I am just so impressed because on top of the business, you are also (laughs) balancing an entire household. (laughs) Not only two <laughs> little ones, like top little ones. Yes. Yelling yes. and screaming in the background. <laughs> and also All the time. 
a husband. And so how do you do it? How do you juggle it all? What's your secret sauce? Good question. Um, first, I should say I'm an active Buddhist. So chanting is my secret <laughs> sauce. That's number one. But it what it comes you down, it does so much. And if I don't do it, my girls are crazy. So that's number one. But really, my girls are, they're five and two and a half, very active in this world. Amy, you can attest to that very in, in the lovely. moment. They're, I love them. <laughs> they are. They are so lovely. But mm-hmm. around me, more badly behaved. I think that's like a mom thing. Mm-hmm. So I always joke with my friends and say, like, my grinchy heart is growing. <laughs> so uh, what I've done really for my business is there's a couple of things. I put boundaries around my business time. So I'm not working on my phone 24 seven when I'm, I made a, a hard and fast rule with me inside of me. When I'm with them, I'm with them. When I'm at work, I'm at work. So there's no like being with them, but being on my phone, like that's a no go because they're so little and they need me. Um, and also I can't get anything done like that anyways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's um, number one. So hard and fast rule about my business time and my family time. Keep it very clear. I try to, when I'm with them, be really present. Like that's another thing is that not to think about problems that I have and just really enjoy this moment because I always think of like, sounds kind of weird, but like if I lose them in any capacity, like I would be like, oh, and I, I wasn't present in that moment. So I kind of use that. Yeah loss feeling mm-hmm. to keep me in the moment. It's kind of a weird to one. remind you. Yeah. I do that sometimes. I know what you mean. <laughs> so I'm like, when they're going to be in college or in the real world, I'm going to really wish I had this time. Yes. So that's yes. kind of how I reframe it. But the mm-hmm. other thing, Amy, that I do that I think has been like the most transformational is that I have to work on my EI too. Like there's mm-hmm. no doubt about it. I am not perfect. I don't, yeah. I will never be perfect. Mm. So I've taught my girls different phrases that help me check myself. Mm. So um, Mm. when my daughter does something pretty regularly that is upsetting, for example, putting, okay, smearing peanut butter all over the table because she just wants to see what it would do. Normally, just upset mommy. Yeah, just (laughs) just to upset me. So, like yesterday, for example, that is actually a real thing. And they've colored themselves with permanent marker while I've been on calls. And yesterday, the the little one threw what was it, smoothie all over the floor after getting her dress wet and then poured water on the table. So, I have taught them the phrase, Mommy, I'm a learning girl. And so, when I get really like, Ah, and I like freak. And so they see that I'm about to freak. They both say, you know, mom, I'm a learning girl. I'm still learning. And so my reply is that, okay, I'm a learning mom. So I'm not going to get it right the first time either. So it's fine to make mistakes, but we need to fix them. And so through them, because she's, she might say before, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh It doesn't help me. And it doesn't help her. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I so, love that. I'm going to steal that from you. you <laughs> I love it because what it does is it like kind of slows you down mm-hmm. and then gives you that breathing room and make you recognize, oh, they're learning. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm learning too. So it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so <laughs> I then I'm, it. I don't feel so mad because I'm like, you know what? You're right. You are a learning girl and it'll take you a while. So, and then I reroute my brain and I say, okay, so you made this mistake. What do you need to do to fix it? Because I don't want her to grow up and feel both of them. Actually, I don't want them to feel bad about themselves or bad about making mistakes. Mm. I don't want to put that into the ether. So doing that. And then when my husband rightfully so gets upset too, I go, you know, we're still learning. All of us are learning together. He's a learning dad. I'm a learning mom. They're learning kids. So it's a, I feel like that is that. So I love it. And that ties in really well in terms of building team spirit, right? So everybody's learning, everybody's growing together and together Mm -hmm. you have better productivity. (laughs) Yeah. And so the other thing about that is that looking at people's weaknesses from their points of strength. So I use what's different about what I do is I use positive psychology to throughout my coaching practice. And what does that mean? That means instead of saying you're deficient or you don't know how to do this, we look at a person's strengths and we go, okay, 
their strength is this, that, and that, because I have an assessment for that. And then we look at their strengths from that point of view. So like for my girls, when I get crazy about their behavior, I go like, okay, but they're employing creativity. So Mm -hmm. I kind of flip it and go like, okay. And I did this strength test for myself and my husband did it as well. And my lowest um, strengths, if you will, were his highest strengths. And they're oh. things that drive me crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but I realize he's he's a yin to my yang. So instead of seeing it as like, this drives me crazy, I go, you know, that's his strength. I need to lean into that. So I've reframed a lot of things. I love it. And it's a lot of internal work, right? Wow. Just by like shifting certain paradigms, you're able to create a totally different 180 different reality. <laughs> yeah, it, and it has been. So now I... I mean, they're still unruly in a way because they're kids, but at the same time, they're going to be, there's going to be a point where they're not. So I need to kind of like lean into that. And it's really hard some days, but some days it's easier. So I got to just kind of roll with it, roll with the punches. I love it. I see so much strength in you. And I'm curious what it, how do you see, what is your definition of a strong mom? Like what does strength mean to you? I think a strong mom, oh, this is a good question, Amy. Okay, a strong mom is actually a mom who, who role models compassion, strength, and kindness, mm-hmm. and, and, and courage even. And I think of when we think about the best attributes of our mom, we think about like how strong they were, how they went through adversity, Mm -hmm. but maybe you didn't know because you were a child, but as an adult, you realize that or how um, resilient they were or how much, um, how many things they had to overcome yet. They were still kind Mm -hmm. yet. They still took the time to be with, you know, be with that person. And I often think like, it's easy to be ourselves. So, and be like, oh, I'm not going to deal with that. Or I don't want to talk to you or this and that. But then I think about like, how do I want my family to be? Like, what philosophy does my family hold? We accept everybody for how they are, how they show up in this world. And we guide them. And I'm not saying it's perfect because it's hard, Mm. but I don't want to have the type of family where we, people feel they're not included because they're a certain way, Mm. because they have too much energy. (laughs) like like you're driving me crazy you're not you can't be in my family putting markers on the wall everywhere yeah yeah, exactly and so you can marker the wall you just have to clean it (laughs) exactly learn not to marker the wall (laughs) it's okay it's a learning process (laughs) it is and so I I am trying to be more grateful and the other thing I do Amy that's kind of new in my practice with my kids is that I thank them for choosing me. Oh, so every night I go, thank you for choosing me as your mom. Cause it's really, they are making me grow Amy and I don't like it. (laughs) Sometimes I am like, voluntary (laughs) growth. I'm like, I don't want to grow in this way, but you know, I say, thank you for choosing me as your mom because they're my little babies who are helping me be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Love it. Thank you, Diana, so much for what you have shared with us personally and professionally. And um, if you could just share with um, everyone how to get a hold of you if they want to get more training or just to get to know you better in terms of what you can help them with, uh, that'd be great. Sure. So the best way to do it right now is LinkedIn because I'm always pretty much always on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So on LinkedIn, my name is Diana E. Lowe and I'm also yellow seems to be my signature color. So you can see on my profile, great in it, yellow shirt. Mm -hmm. And then also you can email me at hi at Diana Lowe, which is my name.com. And I am online. So, you know, feel free to email me and I do have a website, dianalowe.com. Perfect. Any um, last words you want to leave with our strong mamas in the community? I think, you know, be easy on yourself. Every day is going to be different and 
use your village. Amy certainly is a, definitely a part of my village. Mm-hmm. And there are some days where we can be pretty tough on ourselves as women. And then as mothers, there's an extra layer. So if you're running a business, running a household, running some kids and, you know, having a life too, just make sure that you have those boundaries for yourself to be easy and recognize when you need a break or help and have your village there. That's what I would say. Thank you so much, Diana. Thank (laughs) Thank you you. a lot. I'll talk to you later. Thank Thank you. you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us today on Ask Mama Amy. Head over to AskMamaAmy.com for all the show notes and links you heard in today's episode. You'll also get my free legal tool for you to name legal guardians for your children so that you can leave them with abundant resources to support them and a total peace of mind. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe and leave a review to tell us why. See you next time, mamas. Mm-hmm.